Um, welcome to this last uh, SETLA lecture of uh, 2021, 2021. Um, it's, uh, it's good to see uh, you in name or in face and um, I'm very happy that we have this, uh, this last uh, meeting uh, online, not just for pandemic reasons, but also because our speaker is located in Bogota, in Colombia. So uh, Professor uh, Stefan Peters is from uh, Instituto Capaz, as well as from the University of Gießen in Germany. But at the moment he is uh, in Colombia. And um, I think that uh, that will be interesting because then he also can, you know, respond maybe to questions on the situation uh, today um, in in Bogota or other parts of Colombia. Because he's going to talk about the the, the peace process at the crossroads and his assessment of what has happened over the past few years with that peace process and 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 trying to make sense of all the the challenges uh, still uh, ongoing in uh, in Colombia society and and uh, in the relations between previous and current forces that clash uh, deeply on the views of uh, how to move ahead with um, development in the region um if, sorry in Colombia so um I'm, uh, I'm very welcome to, to see Stefan again. We've had some other meetings before, but this is the first time you talk in a, a SETLA lecture. And um, of course, um, this is the, the year, well, even uh, just two weeks ago that, that there was the, the five years um, yeah, commemoration of, of the peace process, but clearly a process very much uh, ongoing. So let me not take um, more of uh, Stefan's time. I just want to inform everyone who's here right now. Um, Stefan will present for around half an hour. Our uh, discussant today will be Professor Kay Konings from uh, SETLA, University of Amsterdam, as well as from Utrecht University, uh, who also knows a lot about conflict in Latin America. So he will be kicking off the discussion, but then we'll open the floor to all of you um, for questions, for uh, reactions. And um, uh, Stefan just said he is very interested in that discussion with, with all of you. So that is the moment when we stop the formal recording and um, we have our group session, our group discussion um, to continue as long as they're you know, pressing questions or ideas to share. So uh, Stefan, the floor is yours. We look forward to hear your presentation. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and uh, good morning from Colombia. Good afternoon to all of you. And it's really a pleasure to be here. And it's also a challenge because uh, talking on five years uh, peace process in Colombia in 30 minutes is something um, I was uh, really afraid when I prepared. And I will um, basically um, try to give some ideas and uh, hope that um, some of these ideas might be even provocative so that we can have some discussion um, afterwards. So it won't be, I, I try to stick into different topics and then uh, see also what is um, the idea where you have most uh, interest in, in discussion. Let me just uh, share my uh, screen. So I guess uh, you can see now my presentation and now also in, um, well, in the mode of uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, and basically I want to do three steps in this, um, in this presentation. First of all, I would um, um, talk, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, transitional justice because uh, I think we can say that uh, transitional justice is a key part of the peace process and actually one of the topics which is most polemic in the peace process. Afterwards, I will talk about problems of design and implementation. And there I will talk basically on the problems in, well, the territories, whatever that is, or let's say in the remote areas, especially. And uh, thirdly, I will uh, talk about some kind of forgotten issues uh, of the peace process or things which are not so much in the peace accords, but uh, which are quite important from my point of view in order to uh, construct uh, sustainable peace in Colombia. 
So let me just first start, and as I'm not so uh, f um, sure if you are all very familiar with the um, situation in Colombia, I will just introduce that um, Colombia started a transitional justice process, a new transitional justice process, because there is a former one, uh, which was from the demobilization of the paramilitaries uh, 2005, and where some colleagues talked about uh, transitional justice without transition. Uh, now we have in, in this piece of court um, new transitional justice uh, mechanisms um, parallel to the ongoing other transitional justice mechanisms. So it's rather complex. And we have this uh, juridical, um, the Jurisdiccion Especial para la Paz, a special jurisdiction for peace. We have a truce commission, which actually will uh, present the report um, in next year in June. And we have a special unit for search of the um, disappeared uh, persons. And that's um, basically the idea is to have an integral uh, system. And however, we could discuss how good it works with integrality. That's not so much where I want to uh, start with the challenges, but rather I will focus on the HEP, so the special jurisdiction of peace and the truth commission and um, let me before uh, before talk about challenges and problems um, um, tell you that um, I think we have to um, we have to say that um, these institutions are very very complex in a very complex situation over more than 50 years and we can discuss when it really started the conflict um, um, but in a more than 50 years ongoing conflict and um, in a situation with a lot of um, different armed groups. So, and they really are um, both in academic um, discussion, but also from international politics. This uh, transitional justice uh, um, system is very much applauded. It's very much applauded because they put uh, victims in the center they have uh, differential approaches, so the ethnic, uh, gender, um, even uh, territorial approaches. And there are um, at least um, the idea to bring intersectionality perspective into uh, transitional justice. And there is really a lot of, um, a lot of um, aspects which make that this uh, process is um, applauded and also there is a lot of uh, interest from academia on these uh, institutions. However, I think there are challenges. So first of all, um, the question of access to justice in the in the hip, it's about especially for those population uh, which is most victimized, um, the socially disadvantaged uh, population in remote areas, because we have to say that yes, it's true. All part of the population were affected, but especially the victims are from uh, the rural areas and especially poor persons. So it's about access to justice uh, related to information about this uh, special jurisdiction. It's about how we can uh, really have the material conditions to access and also issues of, especially in uh, indigenous and Afro-Colombian groups, um, the cosmovision of the uh, special jurisdiction of peace uh, continues to be a rather traditional Occidental, whereas um, this might uh, shock to, uh, with other ideas of uh, other jurisdictions, other ideas of justice. Another uh, challenge is which macro cases, the uh, HEP uh, works with macro cases, which are selected and which are not selected um, yet. So there is a lot of discussion because there is so much uh, different kind of uh, um, violence which occurred. So there is a lot of demand to bring, uh, for example, sexual violence or gender-based violence that disappeared and also um, the uh, forced displacement, which up until today is not yet part of the uh, macro cases, uh, which are uh, well um, investigated in the head. Um, also the question of victims participation, because um, um, we talk about victim centered approach, but we also might have problems uh, how to bring it in on the ground. So how can we do it when we have cases with uh, perhaps uh, 100,000 uh, victims, how they can really participate. And related to the truth con 
commission. I would uh, also, well, of course, we have always time constraints in these uh, issues of transitional uh, uh, justice. We also have internal debates. The same is true for the FIP. But um, I would like to bring the first, perhaps a little bit provocative uh, question or, or thesis. Do victims, do all the victims really hurt the country? And basically the question is how can we make that uh, the very, very good work the Truth Commission is, uh, is doing gets to the general audience. We have a lot of um, events and generally um, there are people who attend these events are uh, the victims and perhaps uh, people um, close to them, people from human rights uh, movements. But my perception at least is that the general public um, does not really follow what happens in the truth commission. And I think something similar is true to the special jurisdiction. So how can we make that that's really a transitional justice process that um, will be in the center of uh, discussion of society? I think that's important. I think that's necessary. And, um, not only in the center um, in a polemic debate if it's uh, if it's um, impunity which it's not from my point of view but basically on how we deal with the past that would be uh, basically the, the main challenge i think for transitional justice uh, um, institution a second uh, point i would like to highlight is uh, problems of design and implementation so um, the first question would be well we have a peace process but do we have peace in colombia and i think um, the answer uh, would highly depend um, with whom you speak or where do you look at so um, where i'm based in bogota yes i think we we really feel the uh, improvement from uh, the peace process, especially in middle class uh, districts of Bogota, it might be a little bit different in the outskirts uh, uh, shanty towns where there are um, armed groups. Um, we, it is cl uh, clearly different in the remote areas of uh, the country in the southwest and the Pacific coast. Uh, in some areas close to the frontier, to, uh, frontier with Venezuela, and some areas of the Caribbean coast, also, for example, in Caquetá and in in the Amazonas region. So basically, in these um, marginalized uh, regions, in these forgotten regions, um, where we have uh, basically the situation of a post-conflict power vacuum, which the state did not enter, uh, lack of social uh, de social development, economic development, and um, abundance of illegal rents that might be coca production, but that might also be illegal mining. So, and I think there we have a kind of a multiplication of actors of political violence in the Colombian periphery. And there I will come to the second point, which is uh, some areas which are where we have some kind of um, yeah, perhaps uh, problems with implementation, but also um, with design. So I do not want to look at the data from, for example, Croc Institute, uh, who do assessment of the implementation, basically a quantitative assessment of the implementation of the peace record, uh, accord. Um, well, they just presented um, new data um, some, some weeks ago. And basically what they um, show in these data and also uh, from other um, assessments of the implementation, we can say that a key point in the peace process, actually it's the first uh, chapter of the peace process is the integral rural reform. And um, everyone or nearly everyone um, is um, or does agree that there is really uh, hardly any process and a lot of blockades. That has to do with land restitution, that has to do with uh, land as a means of power uh, in and of economic and political power and social, uh, social power. It also has to do with the lack of social infra, uh, infrastructure in these areas, uh, especially education, health, but we could also talk about uh, roads in order to get uh, market access for um, agricultural pro uh, uh, products. And there is this idea of development plans with uh, territorial focus, which are the PEDETs, 
uh, which really want to bring development, whatever that is, and we could discuss a lot about it, uh, to these remote areas. However, the problem is, um, I think um, it was very much applauded from Sergio Jaramillo, one of the uh, important actors in the negotiations, his talk at Harvard University on territorial peace. However, uh, my perception that might be also something we could discuss is that uh, rather a territorial peace made in Bogota. So the voice of the regions, from my point of view, is hardly heard, and uh, especially who um, who intervenes in these development plans with territorial focus. For example, government would always say that's really a success story. However, uh, when we talk to um, social leaders from the territories, they would say totally different uh, different things. And the other issue is, can we really talk about territorial peace, past territorial, or should we use plural forms? Are there terri terri territorial sorry, pieces? Are there very different ideas of what might peace be? And I would say yes. Um, when we look at uh, different communities at different um, places in Colombia, there are so many different ideas of what do we really mean by peace? And if we want to bring it, uh, if we want to, uh, link it also to discussion of, uh, let's say, uh, local peace building, uh, for instance, that would be that would mean uh, perhaps totally other thing that uh, than what is really happening in this uh, ideas of territorial peace in Colombia. A second issue is the problem of um, the um, reincorporation of um, ex-combatants. So there is a lot of, um, we have to say that they really managed to a good DDR uh, uh, um, uh, process, uh, really um, demobilization was, was very successful. We have now uh, dissidents of the FARC and that's really a, a problem. But uh, we see that there are um, several problems which we can also see from other parts. So stigmatization, lack of economic perspectives, lack of security, uh, a lot of ex-combatants uh, um, have been assassinated. Um, and we have also pull factors. So newly uh, formed armed groups or older armed groups uh, want to uh, recruit these, um, these ex-combatants for the new structures. So there is really a, a problem with um, uh, the risk of rearming or getting to other armed uh, structures. Another problem I think we have to, we have to address, and especially uh, the situation of violence in the territories. So um, violence, um, I guess you all know about the situation of social leaders, um, the, um, well, the violence against social leaders, human rights defenders, ex-combatants, also environmental leaders. And basically, um, I think one of the lessons learned is that it's not about money, because uh, we could, of course, there's always uh, demand for more money, for more resources, for protection. But um, the government, yes, they, they, they give money. But um, it's about efficient use of money. I think the data show us that that's not the case. Um, the question, once again, of differential approaches. So, uh, for example, um, the, um, the idea they have of protection are very much based on uh, an urban area. Uh, for example, giving uh, minutes for your cell phone or cell phones or panic buttons, which in rural areas might not really uh, help a lot. And the other issue is of participation. Are these people who are, who are in danger, uh, what kind of participation do they have when it comes to protection measures? And actually that's one of the main demands they have. Please do not give me a protection, for example, from people I do not, I do not trust. A lot of these uh, uh, people who protect um, come from, especially when it comes from uh, to social leaders, uh, who are perhaps critical to the state, and then there come people who they um, who should protect them, and they say, well, they have formerly uh, worked in the police. We think that they are more spies. I do not say that that's a, that that's the case, but uh, if there is no participation, there won't be trust, and if there's no trust, uh, there won't be uh, there won't be uh, efficient protection. 
And the third issue is about the situation of illicit drugs, um, especially well, coca. And we can say that there is a boom of coca um, ongoing in Colombia. And with that also, of course, the illegal rents and with that uh, more violence. And we have um, regarding um, the uh, answers of the government, uh, there has been or there still is ongoing a, a project on a voluntary substitution, but there's also um, um, ever more um, yeah, er eradication of, um, of these coca plants, uh, manual eradication and uh, discussions started once again on well, aerial spraying with glyphosate, uh, which has a lot of problems, which also caused a lot of uh, resistance from social leaders. With that, I would like to come to my third point, which are forgotten uh, issues and wrong solutions from my point of view. And of course, here is uh, the, bay, the, the, the part of the, uh, the talk where I suppose that there will be more discussion. First of all, and sorry for uh, bringing this um, um, the statistics, it's about uh, use of cocaine. So when it comes to uh, the war on drugs, uh, we think, and of course it's a problem in Colombia, but I think we have to think, uh, we have to perceive it from an international global perspective. So war on drugs uh, really failed, really failed both in Colombia, but also and in other countries, we could say, but also in the global north, in the consuming um, countries. So the statistics always, I'm, I'm so fascinated by that, how they do this um, measurement of uh, cocaine and base water. And here, um, I guess, um, well, you can see Amsterdam is quite, uh, there seems to be a lot of cocaine consumed. I missed here Berlin because I guess there's also a lot. So um, do not uh, see it as a kind of a diss towards uh, Amsterdam, towards uh, the host of this, uh, of this um, conference, but rather I would like to bring it in order to 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 show the 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 global issue of the of the problem. So from my point of view, and that's something um, colleagues from the international community, for example, here in Colombia, they do not like to hear that. Uh, we if we want to really reduce the problem with international drugs in Colombia, but also in, 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 in Europe, for instance, uh, we know that the mafia there has a lot of influence. So I think we have to change international drug policies. We have to see it as a public health problem, uh, really think about legal, legalization and uh, link it to social development projects uh, um, in the production region, because if not, uh, there are other problems, because for the uh, peasants, coca is basically the problem to have uh, a little bit more decent, uh, decent life. And um, yeah, and perhaps in order to close this point, I would say that um, the drug mafia and the illegal um, armed actors, those who are basically in this in this business, they are not afraid of the of the Colombian military. They are not afraid of um, of um, of glyphosate or other other issues. They are afraid that we take them their business, and I think that's only possible if we think about legalization. Second point of forbidden issues, environmental issues, development, uh, uh, development model. I see that I really have to hurry. Uh, I think, um, unfortunately, we can see that the environment uh, has been until today rather a victim of peace. Um, we could talk about the uh, degradation of, of forests, loss of biodiversity. Colombia is one of the countries with most, uh, with really huge biodiversity, biodiversity uh, hotspots and deforestation. And generally we talk about deforestation. And on the right part of the slide, you can see um, that uh, deforestation really increased, um, well, quite a lot after the peace accords. So why is that the case? Well, basically because um, part of these, uh, uh, of the regions in the Amazon were before um, strongholds of the FARC. The FARC, um, well, they like to present themselves as armed uh, environmentalists. I'm not, I, I really do not agree with that. 
but um, their presence made that um, some kind of investment did not happen so much in these areas. For example, extractive uh, industries or um, also some kind of, um, of um, agricultural development. So basically um, that stopped and now there is uh, really a very, very um, worrying situation of uh, increase of deforestation. So uh, what is here the, um, the forgotten issue? Um, the government never wanted to talk about the development model. Of course, the development model, we have to discuss what is really meant by that. But from my point of view, um, and I think there is not so much discussion that um, Colombia is, is or the, the, the um, development model in Colombia is basically an export uh, natural resource exploitation. So it's basically extractivism. And I think we also have to talk about, um, about a change of the uh, development model that should be a part um, of discussion when we want to talk about sustainable uh, peace and environmental peace. And my third point, and that um, with that uh, point I want to, well, I try to close, is uh, I think we have to talk on, when we talk about the peace, uh, the peace process in Colombia, there is a kind of an elephant in the room, and that are the extreme social inequalities. And I think we have to bring inequalities back in. We all know that inequalities in Colombia and Latin America in general are extreme and persistent, and in Colombia, they are especially high. So when it comes to uh, income concentration, I would just, uh, uh, well, just show the slides, but not um, uh, comment very much on them. Land concentration in Colombia, in a region which is, uh, which is uh, well, notorious for extreme land concentration. Uh, Colombia has an extremely uh, uh, unequal uh, land distribution. But it's not only about the photo of social inequalities, but it's also the lack of inequality uh, of social mobility. Sorry. So um, this is a statistic I always uh, I always um, present because it's so telling from my point of view. We have very extreme social inequalities, and um, there is rather any option for social upward. Uh, mobility according to the OECD. So these um, statistics um, ask for the possibility to um, persons from the um, lowest uh, income decile or quintile um, um, to get a, well, a medium income and uh, in generations. And for Colombia, it's 11 generations. And we could discuss what is a generation. For the uh, OECD, it's 30 years. So, um, and there is a lot of problem with data with that. And, but um, would it really make a, make a difference if it were not um, 11 generations, but nine? So basically what I want to say with that is um, inequality are extreme and inequality are uh, cemented. And why is, um, and I think we see the question of inequality um, for the peace process and many of the aspects I, I mentioned. So for example, when it comes to access to justice from victims, that are especially those uh, victims which are most uh, vulnerable socially. When it comes to re-victimization, of course, it's not only the socially disadvantaged where there is, a pro, where there is this, um, this um, danger, but perhaps especially there. When it comes to the lack of implementation of the point one of the peace accord, the rural reform, uh, who are most affected by the lack of it? Um, I guess it's the most um, the most uh, vulnerable people, and who are most uh, who do not want for example, a change in the agricultural uh, structure that is part of the elite, part of the rural elite and the land owning elite. So their social inequality has a lot to do with that. Who are the leaders, the social leaders and, you, and uh, who are in the focus of the violence? Well, many of them um, who are really in danger uh, live in the remote areas, live in the areas uh, where there is uh, ongoing conflict and most of them are from rather modest social backgrounds and um, also if we talk about um, the effects on the war on drugs who are most affected by that well that are the peasants and also 
um, when we look at, for example, prisons in Colombia, there are a lot of those who, uh, well, are peasants and who bring uh, kind of the, um, the raw material um, to the next steps who are caught by the police and they are in especially from women, it's an important part of the prison population. And that are the poor people, that are the uh, most vulnerable people. So uh, basically, um, uh, and I'm not sure if you know the guy here on the left part of the, of the slide, it's uh, Georg Büchner, a German poet from the 19th century, and well, uh, I think we could say a revolutionary. He talked about, uh, he had a slogan, which is at least in Germany, quite, uh, quite, quite well known. He uh, talked about uh, war to the uh, palaces and peace to the checks. And basically what I, um, and that's of course a thesis and I uh, guess we will uh, have the possibility to discuss on that. Uh, what I see is what happens here in Colombia, uh, a little bit exaggerating um, is something that we have a peace accord, a peace that really works but especially works for those people who are in the cities, who are um, perhaps middle class and who really have a, a lot of benefits from the peace accords. Of course, there are also um, in some parts of the, of the country and rural areas where the situation really has improved. For, that's why I say that it's et cetera. But we have something like war on the sheds, especially in these uh, regions. Uh, I mentioned where, from my point of view, we cannot talk about peace in this moment. Uh, for example, in the part of the Pacific region, south, uh, southwestern region of Colombia, part of the south of the Caribbean, part of the frontier with Venezuela, and so on. And that are impoverished, marginalized regions where there is an ongoing war. So that's why I uh, talk about, uh, can we, or bring the question, can we talk about peace for, to the palaces, war on the checks? Would that be a, a part of the characterization of what is happening in, in, Colum in Colombia? Well, some conclusions. I think uh, Colombia tells us that we have to talk, uh, when we talk about peace, about peace and development. And of course, there are different points or different ideas we can have on development. But I think uh, development is an issue in order to to uh, strengthen peace and uh, peace, of course, can also uh, a good peace, uh, sustainable peace can foster development. I think we have to talk about peace and social inequalities where well, I just talked about it. And I also think we have to talk about peace and uh, power asymmetries, which is basically linked uh, to uh, the issue of social inequalities. And let me just uh, stop with um, something, especially in the first part of this, uh, of this year was, well, in the media, I guess also in the Netherlands, but uh, all over the world, the social protests. And I think there we can see, um, of course, in a very violent way with a lot of repression, uh, that's another uh, forgotten issue to some degree in the peace accord, uh, a reform of the security sector. Uh, with a lot of repression by um, the police force. Of course, uh, protests were not, uh, were not uh, totally peaceful. There was also violence from the protesters. However, uh, what I see here is that it was uh, quite of militant forms of protest, as we can see here in the photo, and you surely have uh, seen a lot of media coverage of that. But uh, what they really, um, we indicated uh, was rather was rather well not so radical so it was about uh, social rights like education work uh, health uh, of course there are a lot of uh, different demands it was about the peace process it was about dignity perhaps and um yeah and i think that also shows us that um perhaps uh, when we talk about the peace process when we talk about uh, a change from or the trans transformation from violence to peace in Colombia, we should really talk about also the social issues and the social inequalities. Well, and here I stop. Sorry for hurrying so much. And um, well, uh, really happy uh, to hear your comments, your critiques, uh, perhaps also questions. And well, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Um... Yeah, you moved. You you did well with the time, actually, and not just with the time. I think uh, you managed to give a, a quick but yet very clear uh, overview of, of what you think 
happened and what should have happened uh, uh, in the peace process um, um, of the past few years. So thank you for that overview. Um, Case Codings will kick off that uh, discussion uh, with you while others may start, you know, think about what is the topic they would like to comment on or have a question on. Uh, and for those of you who are still digesting what you would like to uh, uh, ask or say uh, to, to Stefan, um, you know, you can, I will open the floor uh, after that exchange between a case and Stefan, but uh, you can also already in the in the chat mention that, you know, you have a question or, or, or you want to raise a certain uh, uh, issue. So we get a bit of an overview of the topics that um, you would like to to talk about in the uh, in the Q and A. So, um, Case, can you share some of your sure, sure. views Thank of you what had been said? Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for inviting me uh, um, uh, to be a discussant, and thank you, Stefan, very much for your very uh, clear, uh, uh, insightful uh, presentation that was uh, in many aspects spot on. Uh, and I agree with most of it, but for the last uh, thing, probably. Uh, so uh, what I'll try to do is just uh, give some reflections or maybe some comments and then uh, connect uh, two or three questions uh, following basically the structure that you yourself uh, presented, transitional justice design and implementation and forgotten issues. But the first thing I would like to say when listening to you, I've been working myself, still busy with that on the previous peace process uh, in a long list uh, uh, with the paramilitary. You mentioned that also. I still have to, to process much of what I uh, gathered uh, over the past decade or so. And my first uh, sensation uh, seeing your talk unfold was Groundhog Day. Uh, waking up again and again and again to the same day with the same problems, but also with the same promises. Uh, so. Uh, this is uh, based on the many parallels, if not similarities, between what you uh, signal quite correctly as uh, uh, bottlenecks, uh, shortcomings, obstacles, you name them, uh, of the current peace process with the FARC and the previous one, and maybe the previous and the previous and the previous one. So this is interesting and probably part of uh, has some sort of his uh, 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 historical destiny of Colombia. I would love to hear later the comments by, by Tony Mertens, who I see in the audience uh, on this too. Uh, so, uh, so this is an opening uh, remark. Well, with respect to tradition, uh, transitional justice, I must admit I did, did not follow in as much detail as I've been looking at the previous, the paramilitary piece between quotation marks, of course, uh, as I have been doing since uh, 2016. But my impression is that both mechanisms that you discussed, uh, the uh, special jurisdictions and the, the Truth Commission, uh, are more ambitious and uh, maybe uh, with a, a broader remit uh, than uh, what was set up under the previous process by, under Uribe and the beginning years of, of uh, uh, Manuel Santos. Uh, which was the, the Justice and Peace Law of 2005, you mentioned it, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the Center for Historical Memory, yeah, which was a sort of a predecessor of the, of the truth, uh, the Commission de Esclarecimiento la Verdad uh, uh, Conciliación, in, uh, the third word I, I forgot. So uh, 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 is that indeed true? Uh, what would be, could you be, maybe say a little bit more about the specific modalities of both the transitional justice and uh, the truth commission? And do you think that they would have learned lessons, uh, useful lessons uh, from the previous round uh, with uh, the paramilitary? Uh, I would be just very curious to hear your, uh, your, your views of those. Then the second uh, subject, the design and implementation, and this is actually basically what, what echoes uh, the, the critical discussion of what eventually came out of the, let's call it the Uribe uh, piece eh, with the paramilitary. And no end to uh, all kinds of armed actors, the drug industry alive and kicking, uh, development, uh, social development uh, on the uh, bottom line of the list of uh, priorities. 
uh, the uh, land and uh, territoriality dimensions uh, echoing very much what I think uh, plan consolidation, uh, the consolidation uh, strategy, uh, which was a strange mixture of counterinsurgency, civic action and uh, development under Uribe and the early Santos. So um, uh, here my question would be, uh, uh, were no lessons learned or is it simply inevitable in the sense of the politics of how you deal with the complex uh, scenario of violent pluralism that you see in Colombia. And uh, another way to phrase this question might be, is this a, a glass that is half, half empty or is it a glass that is half full? And I would like to make a small argument in favor of the half full. Because if you look at the longer history of peace efforts in Colombia, you, say, you see that in the 1980s, it was about getting used to the idea of talking with the armed groups at all, and especially convincing the conservative oligarchs and the military that this would be a good thing. Then in the 90s, I think it was about trying to get as much armed groups into the new constitutional order. Had that actually, uh, the 1991 constitution that actually tried to improve Colombia's democracy and make, make it much better and inclusive, and on paper at least make it one of the most perfect democracies in the world if you read, only read the constitution, still uh, in place. Then, uh, 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 although it was for many a shitstorm, uh, the Uribe peace process, and I'm also, of course, very critical, it must at least, at least have achieved one thing, politically eliminating the paramilitary, not eliminating the paramilitary, but politically eliminating the paramilitary to a certain degree. And then in the 2010s, this opened the way uh, to incorporate the FARC. Uh, as a corollary, and this is maybe a controversial, I would also like to hear your and others' views on this. This has paradoxically made the Colombian military into a solid, non political, uh, 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 professional uh, organization, uh, which is not likely to derail. Uh, a political process, but of course brought them into the, the quickmire of dirty warfare and human rights abuse. Uh, but, but at least the country is facing this. So for me, I think this would make uh, the glass half full rather than half empty, but that's up for discussion maybe. And then finally, the, the third point is forgotten issues. Of course, you're totally right. All these issues are forgotten issues. Uh, uh, on the war on drugs, yeah, this has been uh, known for more than three decades. Uh, that's a failure. I myself have been calling the war on drugs not only in Colombia, but in Latin America already a, a crime against humanity for at least the past uh, 10 years. Uh, but it's a very sticky material and it's uh, not about being effective in the war on drugs, but it's about politics and, and the morality behind politics, not in Latin America, but in the North Atlantic and elsewhere in the world, like China and the Muslim countries. So uh, I agree with you, but at the same time, uh, uh, it's hard to, uh, to see a way ahead. Environment, indeed, indeed, but uh, uh, the victim of peace, but the victim of, I would say, everything, almost everywhere in the world, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then uh, inequality, did that made me think of what many people in Colombia, and you must know them, like Rodrigo Uprimni has been talking about transformative reparation uh, and the work of Wendy Lamborn, transformative justice, uh, uh, that, that no peace can endure, no peace is valid if it not tackles these problems of the environment, of inequality, of poverty, of uh, the rule of law, and that's all fair and good. But then my criticism here or uh, reflection would be, then you overburden the peace process. Eh? If the peace process should be at the same time making a, a war-torn country within five years into a Finland or a Denmark, assuming that these are, are, are happy societies, then that's not realistic. So uh, probably in the assessment of the peace uh, process, we should not overburden them with these large developmental concerns. But I do think that peace processes should be sensitive to them. And uh, you should figure out precisely where a peace process as a peace process might be derailed because of its contextualization. So I would also like to hear uh, what you uh, think. And a final uh, crystal ball question. How do you yourself look uh, at, uh, in the midst of all this at next year's uh, presidential and congressional elections. Is there hope beyond uh, Ivan Duque? So 
uh, this is, uh, I think, what I would like to contribute. Thank you again very much, and I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Kees. Um, yes, yeah, Stefan, um, I think you could talk for another half an hour responding to <laughs> all the points, uh, interesting critical points that Kees uh, raised just now. So can I invite you to do that in a bit less time to leave time for discussion, but you have, I mean, I think that, that these were very good points. So also don't feel that you have to kind of rush through them in, in two minutes, that would be a pity. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the comments and really a lot of uh, a lot of issues, a lot of um, well, comments, questions. So first of all, is it waking up again, 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 and always the same issue? Yes and no. So yes, sometimes I think we can see that um, there is similarities, but, and I would like to uh, link it uh, to the question you raised at the end, is the glass half full or half empty? And actually, I think it really depends um, where we look at. And um, I would, um, I always uh, often say, when we talk when we talk about Colombia and we use in Colombia the situation is whatever we commit the first uh, the first error and the big error because it really makes a deal of difference uh, where we look at so I would say that um, the glass is pretty much empty in uh, in regions like a part of Urabá or well, in Urawa, in, um, in some other parts of which I already mentioned, where the situation really seems um, very, very worrying, where, um, well, of course, I do not want to say that that's the general perception, but uh, I heard, for example, from people there who tell me, please uh, give me back my, my guerrilla. So, and referring to the FARC, and basically it's not because they, they liked the guerrilla or they were um, guerrilleros, but they said, well, we had a, a kind of an order. Of course, of course, it's not rule of law and so on, nothing. So it's a, a horrible order, but uh, there was a kind of order. Today, there isn't any, and it's, 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 it's really more troublesome and uh, more, perhaps even more violent for, for, um, well, for the population. However, when we look at other parts, uh, there is really progress. And perhaps I under, or I should have um, insisted a little bit more in, in progress. However, um, as we are here in this uh, kind of discussions, I wanted to bring more the problems. But yes, mm -hmm. and I think it's also, um, for example, a problem from communication, because if we want what we do in academic work, generally we look more at the problems um, and uh, talking about uh, good news is uh, a little bit of boring perhaps, uh, but uh, when we think about communication for a peace process which needs support from the population, which also needs something like, well, hope for a better future, of course we have to highlight that. We have to highlight that is something which seems um, like even, um, I'm not sure if in English we also say that, uh, banal, banal, um, um, or something well, normal, that uh, the number of victims with all the problems, but the number of victims has decreased uh, importantly, and that are lives which are saved. So um, if that's not, an, is, that's not success, so, um, what then can we call uh, success also with the problems with dissidents and so on and other armed groups but yes there are a lot of uh, FARC uh, ex-combatants which are in the in the in the process with all the problems they they face but they are in the process they maintain in the process and um yeah, and with all the uh, internal divides in the FARC uh, party now, um, which basically I think, um, I know that was not your, your question regarding the crystal bar, uh, ball um, in next elections, but it's quite clear that they uh, once again won't get any votes and that it will be the last time that they will have uh, representation in parliament and afterwards, well, the topic of FARC as a political party, um, or especially the topic of the FARC as a structure is something for historians. Um, so, well, 
Um, uh, regarding uh, transitional justice, that's really a, a problem to do it uh, to do it uh, quite uh, quickly. I would say yes. Um, the issue of the transitional justice process, especially the special jurisdiction of peace, really makes it is a different uh, issue than in the uh, peace and justice process. So it's really much more complex, much, very, very more well um, designed. And we have um, much more, and there is a lot of, especially, and I think that's also a kind of a, a challenge. And I really would like to, to stress that from my point of view, it's a challenge because there is a lot of expectations with victim centeredness, with um, uh, giving them possible participation of victims. And I think the special jurisdiction really wants to do so. But for example, then it's a question in political science. I think that's something the most, the most uh, simple issue we would, we would do is, well, let's look if it's a priority, let's look at the budget. And we could also say we need more budget, but I guess, uh, for example, last week I have been in an event in Cali with uh, uh, victims from, well, Valle de Cauca and uh, Cauca. And it's about, for example, issues like psychosocial, psychocultural um, support for victims. And then they say, there's no money. So, um, but uh, then we have the problem, well, there seems to be that it's not uh, so much a priority. And there seems to be that this peace process is a kind of a cheap peace process. Uh, so we could really ask if we need more money. Of course, I know that it's uh, so much a polemic, this, uh, the polarization and so on. So asking for more money would be, uh, uh, would give uh, much of uh, support perhaps for the opponents of the peace process. But on the other hand, we, have we built this very interesting, very complex system, but then we have problems for uh, doing or bringing, uh, giving the opportunity for, for example, victim participation, which really uh, come from lack of resources and lack of time, lack of, so when you have uh, victim participation, that is time consuming. And um, on the other hand, we have the demand, we need now decisions. So um, that's a trade-off. Uh, well, I leave it here. Um, yes, um, uh, um, perhaps on the questions regarding the second point, I guess I, I already answered a little bit, and I won't. Um, yeah, perhaps I go to the last one. Um, or the, um, of course, I'm I'm aware that um, asking for a more kind of transformative approach uh, might. Um, be a little bit other issue than the peace accord. Um, so first of all, I think, and, and that's, I think, really something where we could say, yes, um, it's an important progress. Um, telling that, for example, uh, we have this peace. Yes, it's a fragile peace. It's an um, incomplete peace with a lot of problems, but we are better than before. I think that is something we have to stress. And except perhaps from some parts of the, of the, of the country. And um, so, of course, if we, if um, these issues which I raised, well, we have to bring development model, we have to bring social inequalities, we have to transform the country in order to bring it to, to Denmark or Finland or whatever, the Netherlands. Um, of course, the peace accord wouldn't have been perhaps possible. Um, so, um, and that's a kind of a very, um, let's say very easy position here, um, talking about uh, uh, perhaps even bringing a wish list of what we needed uh, in the perfect world. And I'm aware of that. However, on the other hand, um, I would also say, if we do not address um, these issues, and especially, well, I'm perhaps a little bit biased on the issue of uh, social inequality, but um, and then perhaps we cannot come out of these again and again and again, again, the same, the same problem. So that's a little bit uh, the, the tension here. And elections next, uh, next year, well, um, it will be, from my point of view, but that's nothing, uh, that's nothing new for you. It will be an ugly campaign. And afterwards, it's quite easy, um, I think. Of course, it's not. Um, but um, depends who gets in the second round. So if uh, a candidate from the center gets in the second round, 
he yeah i think it's all men he will win uh, if it's from if it's uh, petro again uh, we vista petro will win but let's see um generally uh let's say uh, having in mind what happened with brexit with trump election and so on i think we shouldn't be too um too optimistic with our prognos pr uh, prognostic competence <laughs> yes i agree um thank you stefan um i think uh, we will stop the recording and continue our conversation right now um